Hello, and welcome to the Fighting Moose Podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Jason Hendrickson. This is a podcast where I retell stories, some fictional and some historical, that can be enjoyed by people of all ages. Today, we read a story about Sir Francis Drake with the story How Sir Francis Drake Sailed Round the World from the book School Reading by Grades, written by James Anthony Froud. This story comes about kind of because of what I've been reading lately, but mostly I just happened to stumble across it. I was looking for a story about Iris from Greek mythology, which led me to finding a story about Jason and his ship Argo. Well, I found a story about Argo, but after I read it, I didn't like it. So then I went in search of another story and found this one. In the story today, you may hear some terms that you aren't familiar with. The first being the horn. I'm pretty sure that when the author says horn, he is talking of the southern tip of South America, as this seems to be consistent with the research I did. The second is the term Patagonia. This is actually a geographic region in what is today Argentina. I will include links to Encyclopedia Britannica articles about Patagonia, Sir Francis Drake, and the Drake Passage in the show notes. While reading this story, I did learn a few things about Sir Francis Drake, and I hope you do too. I'd like to also take an opportunity to thank you for listening to the podcast. This has been a fun journey so far, and I look forward to the stories I will find and share with you in the future. I'd also like to take this opportunity to wish you a Merry Christmas to you and your family. Now, let's turn to today's story. I hope you enjoy. Let's begin. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy. But because they are hard. How Sir Francis Drake sailed round the world. The ships which the Spaniards used on the Pacific were usually built on the spot, but Magellan was known to have gone by the horn and where a Portuguese could go, an Englishman could go. Drake proposed to try. The vessels in which he was preparing to tempt fortune seem preposterously small. The pelican, or gold hind, which belonged to Drake himself, was but 120 tons. At best, no larger than a modern racing yawl, though perhaps no racing yawl was ever better equipped for the work which she had to do. The next, the Elizabeth of London, was said to be 80 tons, a small pinnace of 12 tons in which we should hardly risk a summer cruise round the land's end, with two sloops or frigates of 50 and 30 tons made the rest. The Elizabeth was commanded by Captain Winter, a Queen's officer, and perhaps a son of the old admiral. We may credit Drake with knowing what he was about. He and his comrades were carrying their lives in their hands. If they were taken, they would be inevitably hanged. Their safety depended on speed of sailing, and especially on the power of working fast to windward, which the heavy square-rigged ships could not do. The crews, all told, were 160 men and boys. On November 15, 1577, the Pelican and her consorts sailed out of Plymouth Sound. The elements frowned on their start. On the second day, they were caught in a winter gale. The Pelican sprung her mainmast, and they put back to refit and repair. Before the middle of December, all was again in order. The weather mended, and with a fair wind and smooth water, they made a fast run down the coast to the Cape de Verde Islands. 
They're taking up the Northeast trades. They struck across the Atlantic. They passed the mouth of the Plate River, finding to their astonishment fresh water at the ship's side in 54 fathoms. On June 20th, they reached Port St. Julian on the coast of Patagonia. It was now midwinter, the stormiest season of the year, and they remained for six weeks in Port St. Julian. They burnt the 12-ton pinnace as too small for the work they had now before them, and there remained only the pelican, the Elizabeth, and the marigold. In cold, wild weather, they weighed at last, and on August 20th, made the opening of Magellan's Straits. The passage is 70 miles long, tortuous and dangerous. They had no charts. Icy mountains overhung them on either side. Heavy snow fell below. They brought up occasionally at an island to rest the men and let them kill a few seals and penguins to give them fresh food. Everything they saw was new, wild, and wonderful. Having to feel their way, they were three weeks in getting through. They had counted on reaching the Pacific that the worst of their work was over and that they could run north at once into warmer and calmer latitudes. The peaceful ocean, when they entered it, proved the stormiest they had ever sailed on. A fierce westerly gale drove them 600 miles to the southeast outside the Horn. The marigold went down in the tremendous encounter. Captain Winter and the Elizabeth made his way back into Magellan's Straits. There he lay for three weeks, lighting fires nightly to show Drake where he was, but no Drake appeared. They had agreed, if separated, to meet on the coast in the latitude of Valparaiso, but Winter had chicken-hearted, and sore, we are told, against the mariner's will, when the three weeks were out, he sailed away for England, where he reported that all the ships were lost but the pelican, and that the pelican was probably lost too. Drake had believed better of winter, and had not expected to be so deserted. He had himself taken refuge among the islands which form the Cape, waiting for the spring and milder weather. He used the time in making surveys and observing the habits of the native Patagonians. The days lengthened and the sea smoothed at last. He then sailed for Valparaiso, hoping to meet winter there, as he had arranged. At Valparaiso, there was no winter, but there was, in the port, instead, a great galleon just come in from Peru. The galleon's crew took him for a Spaniard, hoisted their colors, and beat their drums. The pelican shot alongside. The English sailors, in high spirits, leaped on board. No life was taken. Drake never hurt man if he could help it. The crew jumped overboard and swam ashore. The prize was examined. 400 pounds weight of gold was found in her, besides other plunder. Drake went on next to Tarapaca, where silver from the Andes mines was shipped for Panama. At Tarapaca, there was the same unconsciousness of danger. The silver bars lay piled on the quay. The muleteers who had brought them were sleeping peacefully in the sunshine at their side. The muleteers were left to their slumbers. The bars were lifted into the English boats. A train of mules or llamas came in at that moment with a second load as rich as the first. This too went into the pelican's hold. The bullion taken at Tarapaca was worth nearly half a million ducats. Still, there was no news of winter. Drake began to realize that he was now entirely alone and had only himself and his own crew to depend on. There was nothing to do but to go through with it, 
danger adding to the interest. Erica was the next point visited. Half a hundred blocks of silver were picked up at Erica. After Erica came Lima, the chief depot of all, where the grandest hall was looked for. At Lima, alas, they were just too late. Twelve great hulks lay anchored there. The sails were unbent, the men were ashore. They contained nothing but some chests of reels and a few bales of silk and linen. But a thirteenth, called the Cacafuego, had sailed a few days before for the Isthmus with the whole produce of the Lima mines for the season. Her ballast was silver, her cargo gold and emeralds and rubies. Drake deliberately cut the cables of the ships in the roads that they might drive ashore and be unable to follow him. The pelican spread her wings and sped away in pursuit. He would know the Cacafuego, so he learned at Lima by the peculiar cut of her sails. The first man who caught sight of her was promised a gold chain for his reward. A sail was seen on the second day. It was not the chase, but it was worth stopping for. Eighty pounds weight of gold was found, and a great gold crucifix set with emeralds said to be as large as pigeon's eggs. We learn from the Spanish accounts that the viceroy of Lima, as soon as he recovered from his astonishment, dispatched ships in pursuit. They came up with the last plundered vessel, heard terrible tales of the rover's strength, and went back for larger force. The pelican, meanwhile, went along upon her course for 800 miles. At length, off Quito, and close under the shore, the Cacafuego's peculiar sails were sighted, and the gold chain was claimed. There she was, going lazily along a few miles ahead. Care was needed in approaching her. If she guessed the pelican's character, she would run in upon the land, and they would lose her. It was afternoon. The sun was still above the horizon, and Drake meant to wait till night, when the breeze would be off the shore, as in the tropics it always is. The pelican sailed two feet to the Cacafuego's one. Drake filled his empty wineskins with water and trailed them astern to stop his way. The chase supposed that she was followed by some heavily loaded trader, and, wishing for company on a lonely voyage, she slackened sail and waited for him to come up. At length, the sun went down into the ocean, the rosy light faded from off the snows of the Andes, and when both ships had become invisible from the shore, the skins were hauled in, the night wind rose, and the water began to ripple under the pelican's bows. The Cacafuego was swiftly overtaken, and when, within a cable's length, a voice hailed her to put her head into the wind, the Spanish commander, not understanding so strange an order, held on his course. A broadside brought down his main yard, and a flight was cut away. The ship was cleared, a prize crew was put on board. Both vessels turned their heads to the sea. At daybreak, no land was to be seen, and the examination of the prize began. The full value was never acknowledged. The invoice, if there was one, was destroyed. The accurate figures were known only to Drake and Queen Elizabeth. A published schedule acknowledged to 20 tons of silver bullion, 13 chests of silver coins, and a hundred weight of gold, but there were gold nuggets beside in indefinite quantity, and a great store of pearls, emeralds, and diamonds. Drake, we are told, was greatly satisfied. He thought it prudent to stay in the neighborhood no longer than necessary. He went north with all sail set, taking his prize along with him. The master, San Juan de Anton, was removed on board the pelican to have his wound attended to. 
He remained as Drake's guest for a week and sent in a report of what he observed to the Spanish government. One at least of Drake's party spoke excellent Spanish. This person took San Juan over the ship. She showed signs, San Juan said, of rough service but was still in fine condition with ample arms, spare rope, maddox, carpenter's tools of all descriptions. There were 85 men on board all told, 50 of them men of war, the rest young fellows, ship boys, and the like. Drake himself was treated with great reverence. A sentinel stood always at his cabin door. He dined alone with music. The pelican met with many other adventures and at last sailed for home, sweeping in fine clear weather round the Cape of Good Hope. She touched once for water at Sierra Leone and finally sailed in triumph into Plymouth Harbor. English sympathy with an extraordinary exploit is always irresistible. Shouts of applause rang through the country and Elizabeth Every bit of her, an English woman, felt with her subjects. She sent for Drake to London, made him tell his story over and over again, and was never weary of listening to him. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fighting Moose Podcast. Please join us next time as we read another exciting story. Today's music was provided by the artist Analog by Nature, and the audio clips were provided from NASA. For more information to download and or listen to audio or materials from all our recordings, or to contact us, please visit www.thefightingmoose.com, or you can follow the links in the show notes. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you get your podcast or on iTunes and tell a friend. Thank you for your patronage, and as always, try and do a random act of kindness every day. Mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history. And it's come to a final stop.